Professor André Streidum, the Acting Executive Dean, Faculty of Science, Professor Reinhard Mayboom, our inductee, Professor Andreas Ruet, our respondent from the University of the Free State, where he's a distinguished professor in chemistry, senior leaders of the university, members of Senate and other academics, colleagues from other universities, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Sunny Bonani, Guyanand, good evening, Tobela. It's indeed a great honor and special privilege for me to welcome you to the professorial <coughs> inaugural lecture of Professor Reynold <coughs> Mayboom. I hope you don't get as emotional as I about your inaugural lecture here today. <laughs> as I do so, I wish to express a warm word of welcome to his loved ones, special guests and colleagues. And I know that his mom and dad is in the audience as well as his wife. And I'm going to use his words, his lovely wife. A warm <laughs> word of welcome to all of you here. This is indeed a proud and joyful, yet a landmark moment for all of you, for Professor Reinhardt and of course for us here at UJ and higher education in South Africa and beyond. The inauguration of professors is a public ceremony in which newly appointed professors are inducted into office by the Vice Chancellor and deliver the inaugural addresses. The ceremony has its roots in the medieval university and serves multiple purposes. Firstly, it's an expression of welcome and entry for new professors, joining the circle of colleagues who are already professors. And secondly, it provides a platform for the professors to display their expertise in the discipline and showcase their research. Today, we gather to bear witness to the entry of Professor Major to the illustrious community of scholars at the university. It is a celebration of the contributions to the discipline and ultimately the related impact on society. Professors provide the university with its identity, character, and academic legitimacy and integrity. The inaugural lecture is a rite of passage following the confirmation of the appointment of the person as a professor. This evening, we will listen to Professor Mayboom as the gown goes to town. By this, I mean that the power of the inaugural address is when the expertise is showcased behind the corridors of the university and reverberates within society. It stands as a moment of pride for the incumbent, the family, fellow scholars, the university, and ultimately society. For the German philosopher and diplomat Humboldt, a university referred to the world community of scholars and students engaged in the common search for truth. Newman talked about teaching universal knowledge. Recently, universities has been viewed as instrumentalist serving the purpose of the economy or utilitarian in purpose. I would hope that we can break out of these narrow conceptualizations and reflect on the university as contributing to the public good. Edward said in an article titled On Defense and Taking Positions, offers a formulation of the ideal role of the true intellectual. And he states, and I quote, one who commands a vast knowledge of his uh, discipline who is rigorous in the analysis of literature, reviews being an intellect as a vocation, the intellectual who considers it's necessary to step into the public sphere and to speak truth to power, namely to question, interpret, and understand authority rather than consolidating it, to step out of the boundaries of the acad academy, to connect oneself, to affiliate oneself, to align oneself with an ongoing process of contest of some sort, perhaps with the aim of improving the lot of the oppressed. The intellectual will functions as a kind of public memory to recall what is forgotten or ignored, to make the connections that are otherwise hidden, and to provide alternatives for mistaken policies. It remains then for us as a university with a pan-African vision to derive our mandate as intellectuals and as professors how do we embrace the role of a professor as a disruptor while continuing to be a flagship carrier of our disciplines? This evening, we will listen to Professor Mayboom as one further step in the journey of being a professor. However, Professor, this is a journey which does not culminate once this lecture has been given. It's a self-reflective pause in the journey of the professor with a promise of more to enrich our minds and simultaneously contributing to the rich intellectual body of work in the related discipline. Let me now invite the Acting Executive Dean, Professor Andre Streidom, to introduce Professor Mayboom. <laughs> 
I thank you, Ria Boha, Sia Bonga, Paya Danki. Acting Vice Chancellor, Professor Swart, um, Professor Mayboom, Respondent to Professor Mayboom, Prof. Andre Root from University of Free State, distinguished guests and visitors, friends and family of Prof. Mayboom and colleagues. It, it, it is with considerable honor and pleasure that, that, that I'm going to read to you uh, a very brief a very brief version of the, the curriculum vitae of uh, Professor Mayboom. But let me start by saying that um, I'm always extremely intimidated when I'm in the, the company of chemists. Uh, and it, 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 it is an especial, especially warm moment for me to notice that we have in the audience <coughs> Professor Holtzapfel, uh, professors of chemistry who were in a position to teach chemistry three to me when I was an undergraduate student. <laughs> they tried hard uh, with not much success. <laughs> uh, it, it, it took me a little while into organic chemistry 3b to realize that it is probably in my best interest and in the best interest of my lecturers <laughs> not to pursue a career in chemistry. <laughs> So I, I diverted and I went into physics. <laughs> so a special, Prof. Holtzapfel, if I may extend, a special word of welcome to you as well. And Professor Holtzapfel, it, 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 is, it is just a, a very heartwarming feeling every time I see you walking to and from your lab. Even now, so many years after you have lectured to me, it, it, is, it is heartwarming. Um, a very brief version very much abbreviated version of the very impressive curriculum vitae of, of Professor Mayboom, was born and raised in the Netherlands. He studied chemistry at the University of Groningen, where he completed his MSc research under Professor Jan Tuben. During his studies, he was a member of the first organized group of students visiting South Africa in 1993. That was a year before the turning point of, of this wonderful country. After his studies, Reynard moved to Cape Town to pursue his PhD in organometallic chemistry under the supervision of Professor John R. Moss. He started his PhD studies in April 1997. During his PhD, he prepared lithiated dendrimers with up to 12 carbon <coughs> lithium bonds. These compounds are highly oxygen sensitive and spontaneously burn in air. Following his PhD, he pursued a postdoctoral fellowship with Professor Andre Root at the then Rand Afrikaans University, currently University of Johannesburg, and the University of the Free State. Initial work revolved around cobalt catalyzed hydroformulation. Later on, the work moved in the direction of <coughs> crystallography. One of the subjects pursued was the crystallography of silver coordination complexes. In 2007, he received his first rating and evaluation by the National Research Foundation as a scientist. Reiner took up the position of senior lecturer at the University of Johannesburg in October 2008. That's uh, 10 years and a month ago. There he changed his research direction towards heterogeneous catalysis. I suspect not under trivial influence from, from some of colleagues uh, in the chemistry department. The initial work involved the synthesis of exceptionally well-defined nanoparticles as catalysts. catalysts. The work proved popular, and the first paper published on this work has been cited over 140 times. Subsequent papers published in the area of heterogeneous catalysis proved also very popular as evidenced by their citations. Citations for those uninitiated is one measure of how we determine how popular, not only how popular is the work that you are doing, but how important your peers in the field evaluate your work to be. If they do, they cite you. Subsequent papers published in the area of heterogeneous catalysis proved also very popular by their citations. In 2009, Reynard was awarded the Reichs Medal by the South African Chemical Institute for or original chemical research showing outstanding promise, 
as adjudged by publications in reputable journals. The study of silver coordination compounds was ongoing at UJ, and some of the compounds proved to induce selective apoptosis in cancer cells while not showing toxicity in healthy cells. The study of these compounds has been continued and the apoptotic behavior has been patented internationally. An additional patent is currently being filed. Publications related to this work have attracted media attention and the subject has been featured on television, including uh, a broadcast of carte blanche in 2018. Since 2008, a close collaboration with Shumatsu South Africa developed and we, we, we are exceptionally proud of having two representatives of South Africa's Shumatsu here with us tonight. I think they are sitting over there, if I'm correct, without my glasses. <laughs> As part of the collaboration, consultancy with Frontier Labs in Japan resulted in the development of a fixed bed reactor system based on the pyrolysis unit of Frontier Labs. Current expansion of the collaboration has resulted in the future establishment of a Sumatsu Innovation Center at UJ, something of which this uh, faculty is exceptionally proud of and with no minor <coughs> influence from the work of, of uh, the group of Professor Reynold Mayboom. Since 2012, Reynold is rated C2 by the NRF. Uh, C2 is the category in the National Research Foundation where they consider you to be an internationally recognized researcher. It's no mean achievement. It's no mean feat. He raised through the ranks at UJ to full professor and is the current head of the Department of Chemistry. Reynold has published over 150 research papers and has, was awarded the Faculty of Science Research Award four times in ten years. A remarkable achievement if you think of the competition in the Faculty of Science. <laughs> Reynold is happily married to Professor Lizelle Piater, uh, right here with us in the front row, has two dogs and two cats. <laughs> <laughs> and in his spare time, he trains Kyokushin Karate. Now, I'm not sure if this is a, a, a spelling mistake. It says here, and an ancient. Is Kyokushin Karate not an ancient Japanese martial art? It is, yes. It is. So there's a spelling mutation uh, problem here. He trains Kyokushin Karate as an ancient Japanese martial, martial art. So be careful <laughs> <laughs> about pronouncements you make within hit distance from Professor Maibom. <laughs> Professor Maibom, may I ask you to join us here? Thank you. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not a big one on ceremony, so I, I won't do the thank you everyone for being here. Um, a long, long time ago, oh, I forgot my little beeper thing. A long time ago, <coughs> I watched a presentation by Professor Roth, and he started off acknowledging the people first acknowledging everyone before the start of the presentation and it is absolutely clear why because you get so excited about the science that you run out of time to actually say thank you to everyone <laughs> ladies and gentlemen thank you for being here um my rather odd title here about red pills and blue pills will be explained a little bit early uh, a little bit later i will start off with uh, thanking everybody first um, most importantly, I'd like to thank my family. It cannot be easy for parents to see a child on the other side of the world. So, my parents, thank you for being here. Really, really special. <coughs> As a scientist, I've noticed that it's really important that you take a picture that's about 10 years outdated, because you <laughs> always look way better. <laughs> 10 years ago, so um, this is a picture from about 10 years ago. My parents who flew over back then for the wedding as well. And of course I would like to acknowledge my lovely wife who actually keeps me out of trouble <laughs> more often than um, people realize. 
Ladies and gentlemen, um, bes besides my family, oh, besides my family, I've had a number of mentors. I, I would say a couple of thousand, so I'm only acknowledging three of them. Um, Professor Jan Tober taught me really the intricacies of air sen sensitive synthesis back home in Holland in, at the University of Groningen. So I'm really grateful for all, everything I learned there. Professor, the late Professor John Moss I did my PhD with, I'm pretty sure I was a very difficult um, child to him. Mm -hmm. And finally, Professor Andre Roth, I did my postdoc with him and I learned a tremendous amount about crystallography and kinetics from him. Um, ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't mean I do not acknowledge everybody else, but my four there's a time limit of 40 minutes and uh, I'm, I'm afraid if I mention all the names, I'm busy 90 minutes. So <laughs> everybody else, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> specifically those colleagues who find me running into their office on a regular basis saying, what about this weird idea? And, and then I see the eyes rolling and going <laughs> like, please go and get out of my office. <laughs> but not until I've had my um, a little bit of feedback. Thank you everyone who's been there advising me, young and old. Some people have advised me in one sentence that changes your life. Other people have had a long relationship, but everybody, thank you very much. My research group, only a picture of a couple of students here. Um, these guys are awesome. The top researchers, each and every single one of them, um, most of them graduate with a number of very good papers on their name and they prove that hard work <laughs> and talent really, really get you where you need to be. Um, ladies and gentlemen, of course the research was happily performed with some financial support. As an academic, everybody, all the academics here understand you, you endlessly beg for money. Um, <coughs> and there were times that I, I seriously considered standing on the side of the road at a pick and pay to ask for bursary <laughs> monies, but fortunately some institutions assisted us with, with the research. University of Johannesburg gave me a couple of very good grants. I've had some very fantastic grants from Cecil Research. Um, the NRF has sponsored some of the work on and off. They, they tend, to, tend to give you like a sabbatical year between your grants. Um, and I've had some money from the TESP fund from ESCOM, <coughs> which is greatly appreciated. Um, besides financial funding, I've had the pleasure of working with a couple of in, uh, companies where they greatly assisted me with the use of their equipment. Specifically, Shimatsu South Africa has helped me tremendously with some permanent demonstration equipment. Were some scientific, which is just down the road, I uh, have a fantastic showroom and some of my students were on a weekly basis there measuring their samples on, on their equipment. Portec has put some demonstration equipment in my lab and assisted with a conference that I've organized. And of course Frontier Labs, it's just been explained, they donated a fixed bed reactor to the research group. Um, and finally, before I forget it, I want to say thank you to Nkasi who graciously helped us with all the red pill and blue pill bottles <laughs> only Saturday. So thank you everyone for assisting me in this 21 year journey in South Africa. Most of the researchers know that life and research is not a straight road. We do not go through our research sticking on the road. Every once in a while you find something ser serendipitously. And specifically in chemistry, things don't work, you investigate why it doesn't work. You've got a serendipitous discovery. Or things work despite what you expect it to work. And you find something strange. When that happens, you need to choose. Are you going to pursue the side road or are you sticking on the road doing the same thing you've <coughs> always been doing? Serendipity, um, colleagues and friends, is of, of course derived from the wonderful Persian story about the three princes of Serendip. Serendip is Sri Lanka these days. And these guys were trying to find the camel back because uh, the camel had disappeared and they were trying to find the camel and they found 
things that they were not looking for every time. So serendipity is derived from this fantastic story. And these days in science, it's really, it really means discovering something you haven't been looking for. And that is a story throughout my research and a story throughout my life. And then when you find something you haven't been looking for, you're faced with this situation. Do you take the blue pill, stick on the same road, and do what you've always been doing, believing what you've always been believing? Or do you step outside your comfort zone, take the red pill, and go down the rabbit hole into wonderland? It is really difficult, but the red pill is where the fun is. Ladies and gentlemen, the person here, this is obviously related to the movie The Matrix, the 1999 movie The Matrix, and the person modeling Morpheus here, holding the two blue pills, is the, the now Dr. Melissa Nemanashi, who, who was the first graduate from my research group in 2012. And his work will feature a couple of times here. Of course, the Wonderland and, and Rabbit Hole refers to the fantastic Lewis Carroll book Alice in Wonderland. And another special person is modeling Alice over here, looking down the rabbit hole. <laughs> um, this is Mrs. Batsila Mogudi. This is a tremendously inspiring story. Batsila dropped out of uh, education in 1976. And then when her children grew up, she realized she can't help them with her homework. So she started educating herself, first high school, then university, then an honors, then an MSc, and she's doing a PhD at this moment at the same rate that the children were, were educated. But Sila turned 62 days ago, last Sunday, and she will submit her PhD thesis at the end of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, a <laughs> truly <laughs> inspiring story. <coughs> so moving outside of your comfort zone, and this is a picture my colleagues are all holding their hands up to their head right now because this is a picture I've drawn on every single board <laughs> in the department. <laughs> um, the magic happens outside your comfort zone. <coughs> it's not easy, but that's where the magic happens. Not just the magic, the research happens outside your comfort zone. So it's tremendously important specifically for the students to realize <coughs> move outside your comfort zone. It's not easy, it's scary, it's difficult, but it's fun afterwards. Most of my work has been involved around catalysis. Catalysis is speeding up a reaction by adding a substance that does not get, um, does not get consumed. And most textbooks show <coughs> catalysis like this with an energy hump and some strange things at the bottom. Th to me, this doesn't really bring the essence of catalysis, specifically people that haven't studied this field will not really understand it. This fantastic little cartoon by Gary Rotenberg from the University of Amsterdam indicates it better to me. You can either go over the hill, over there where the bee is, or you can go just around the hill. Catalysis is about taking a different route to your product. And that's what a lot of the research that I've been performing was about. Take the different route. Again, move out of your comfort zone. When I came to Cape Town to do my PhD, which was obviously a tremendous red pill moment, you take the decision to go outside your comfort zone, outside your home country, go to a country that you actually don't know anything about except for whatever you've seen on TV, um, be in a situation where you can't really speak the language even, um, hence my strange accent that, uh, that you're bringing. Um, I, I was asked to work on so-called dendritic molecules, dendromers. Um, very fittingly, dendromer is Greek for tree, and the surname is, is Maybom, May tree, so may maybe there was, an <laughs> there was a hint. These molecules are schematically depicted on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side you see a tree with the roots, and Maybe you see the similarities. I've never seen the similarities, but that's fine. 
the nice thing about these molecules is, are, is that they are tremendously symmetrical. And the chemists in the audience will appreciate the uh, symmetrical nature of these compounds and also how simple the analysis ends up being. The spectroscopy is tremendously simple because your signals are all overlapping in the molecules. The problem is if you make a mistake in your um, synthesis, you see it straight away in the spectroscopy. It's part of the PhD um, research which aimed at gluing a catalyst on the end of the branches of a dendrimer. We made these lithiated dendrimers with 12 pyrophoric lithium carbon bonds. So these things spontaneously burn in air. If you take them out of the flask, they, they burn spontaneously. And these carbon lithium bonds, to the best of my knowledge, this is the largest carbon lithium molecule ever reported in the literature. I used to have a very expensive bottle of wine for the person who would repeat this work. Um, <laughs> and then a house sitter decided to drink it and told me it wasn't very good wine. So <laughs> that was a bit disappointing. But that's kind of the work. And the reason I'm showing this work is 10 years later at UJ, this type of work came back and started my work in heterogeneous catalysis. So th this is part of the PhD work. And then in 2008, I got a phone call from the then HAD saying, Reinhard, why didn't you apply to the position? And I answered with, I didn't know there was one, because <laughs> I, I, I didn't read the newspaper. <coughs> so during the interview, the question was posed to me, we need somebody doing heterogeneous catalysis. Do you want to do heterogeneous catalysis? Now, for the non-chemist in the public, homogeneous catalysis is in the same phase. So you have sugar in tea that would be homogeneous. Heterogeneous catalysis would be sand in the tea. So you've got two different phases. But they're completely, distinctly different disciplines to do research in. So, of course, I took the, ro the red pill, because that makes life interesting. And I said, yes, I'll do heterogeneous catalysis. I've got no clue what it means. I don't know what to do. I must be completely crazy, like during this hippie party. <laughs> and <laughs> I'll do it. So my research in heterogeneous catalysis started in 2009, and I said, let's work from the strong points. I've got a fantastic background in dendrimer mm -hmm. chemistry. I've learned a lot of kinetics from Professor Rudd. So let's make these well-defined nanoparticles inside a dendrimer. And the reason for that is these nanoparticles are formed by the template. And if you have a perfect template, you should be able to get very narrowly dif dispersed nanoparticles. And then take these things and start doing reactions with them with the aim of elucidating the mechanism. How does this reaction go? So we made, made these den uh, dendrimer templated nanoparticles. It's not a trivial exercise. If you do it wrong, your nanoparticles escape the dendrimer and precipitate out in solution and you've got a big mess. So you have to really finely tune your reactions. But we were able to make these well-defined small particles, nanoparticles, and actually do some reactions with it. So the first paper that was reported on this work was by <coughs> Melissa Nemanashi from his MSc work. That's the paper that Professor Stratum referred to as being cited almost 150 times now. It was the best, uh, most cited paper in the Journal of Colloid and Interface Science. And this started off investigating a model reaction, the reduction of nitrophenol. Now, nitrophenol is an environmental toxin. The product is a nice chemical. It doesn't kill everything. Um, so it's environmentally <laughs> useful to look at look at this reaction and from there we developed an interest in the actual mechanism. How does this reaction work? So subsequent work looked at the reaction mechanism where your one reagent has to <laughs> stick to the surface of the dendrimer, the other reagent has to stick to the surface, get a reaction and then your product diffuses off the actual surface of the nanoparticle. And this is just a schematic drawing of how this we propose this is happening. Now this work 
takes a tremendous amount of mechanistic investigations. And we do this using very simple spectroscopy, uv spectroscopy, but you need a tremendous amount of data points. And just as an illustration, I'm showing here a couple of data points. Um, this is on only half of the data points reported in this paper. Every data point is performed in triplicate. And you see a data fitting of the horrible equation at the top to these data points, and those are the solid lines in these graphs. So this is a tremendous amount of work, but it confirms that the mechanism that we propose is happening is very likely to be true. Now this work we've done on a number of different metals with a number of different reactions, and we kind of see that the actual mechanism works for all the systems, and that the nanoparticles are stable, the system works. So this is from the last five years, some of the kinetics we've done, and it's a fair amount of work. And the students were pretty upset with me kicking them back to the lab for more data. Then. Of course, that's never a nice thing. But these are just model reactions for us. What we want is move towards more industrially relevant reactions. So the first thing that we tried is take these well-defined nanoparticles that we took all this effort to make and then put them on a surface so we have a solid to work with. So we take these d nanoparticles, put them on the surface and then burn off your dendritic molecule and the first thing that happens when you burn them off is those nanoparticles start rolling over the surface of your support, start aggregating, and all this work we did to have well-defined nanoparticles was gone. We were stuck. How do we get from these well-defined nanoparticles to well-behaved catalysts with nanoparticles that are have a decent size distribution? So <coughs> I thought, and this is a recurring theme as well, I'm afraid, <laughs> I thought we need to get shot glasses that we stick these little nanoparticles, these balls in. If you have the balls on the surface, they roll around and meet each other. If you have them in glasses, you, mo you, you need to really put a lot of energy in them to move from one glass to the next glass. So can we make these molecular shot glasses or molecular tubes? And indeed, in the literature, there's quite a bit of this stuff. They're called mesoporous metal oxides or mesoporous materials. They're typically made, made of silicon, and we see over here that these are literally tubes. On the left-hand side, you see that there are tubes, and on the right-hand side, you see that these are hexagonally packed. And the idea is literally, let's throw these nanoparticles in the tubes. That way, they don't have a chance to meet another one and aggregate. So we started doing this, um, but all the literature is showing silica and titania for the chemists. Silica and titania are two supports that are completely inert. So that's, uh, that's no fun. Everybody's doing it. We wanted something else. We wanted a mesoporous metal oxide of a metal that can assist in the catalysis. So we, we were looking at, can we take cobalt oxide, ceria, transition metal oxides, and make these molecular tubes from them? So the initial research was promising. We took silica-based uh, metal oxide, mesoporous metal oxide, impregnated them with, a, with metal oxides like iron oxide and, and cobalt, then removed the silica template, in which case you kind of get tubular-shaped material with crosslinks and then put the metal on it. But this while it works, you get a couple of milligrams. You don't have enough to work with, which is a bit disappointing. Um, <coughs> and then we found a paper in the literature describing how to make these mesoporous metal oxides of any metal possible. And this is really what we're doing here. Is we make little cubic crystallites and throw them in a box. So we don't pack them. We throw them in a box, and then because we have regular crystallites, you have a reg regular pore size distribution between these crystallites. Similar to Lego pieces that you throw in a box, 
and it packs regularly even though from the outset from the outside it looks really like a mess so we made these materials and but Sile did the pioneering work for this we made these materials and found that they are catalytically active themselves so here we've got some cobalt oxide for example and I'm using the same reaction here the reduc reduction of nitrophenol the same um, destruction of environmental pollutants and we found for the first time that cobalt oxide can catalyze this reaction um, what we also find is found is that we can tune the size of these nano these crystallites from very small to very large and the larger crystallites didn't do it but the smaller ones did it so we, we can make these things in different sizes then we found that if you add metals to these crystallites it goes even faster so that's really exciting now we have a support that is catalytically active and we haven't put the actual catalyst on there yet so what happens if you put the extra catalyst on it we get a tremendous increase in the rate of reaction for the nitrophenol reduction we see up to 16 times increase from going from silica to syria um, and what we think and this is again for the chemists what we think is that the redox couple of the supports actually assists the reaction on the metal so the reaction goes faster because there's an what we call because we don't really know what's happening what we call a synergistic effect on the reaction we've investigated this with a couple of reactions and some of the model reactions go up to 240 times faster as compared to the silica equivalent and this is obviously normalized on the surface of the metal normalized on pretty much everything and 240 an increase in the rate of reaction of 240 times that is significant that is really really significant um, let's jump to a slightly different subject in about 2006 2007 I was looking at the crystallography of silver compounds the or rather I was <laughs> assist, uh, uh, writing a review paper on the crystallof crystallography of silver compounds and it was clear the chemistry of silver complexes is just a mess nobody knows what's going on there are no rules that apply properly there are about 15 different types of shapes of the molecules of these sil silver compounds and as a result absolutely nobody's working in the field so I said well that is fantastic we're looking at a group of potentially 3,000 compounds and nobody's interested in it because nobody understands what's going on so let's have a look let's look what we can do can we dis find out if there is a rule behind all this behavior um, and those of you who've been teaching inorganic che chemistry specifically the second year about molecular structure the textbooks are not right they're wrong <laughs> <laughs> these these molecules are not linear <laughs> <laughs> these molecules have all kinds of weird and wonderful shapes we've done the crystallography on approximately 150 of these compounds these are just a couple of examples crystallography for those not doing chemistry determines the shape of the molecules it determines exactly where each atom in the molecule is and how it packs <laughs> we found that this is a complete mess there's no real reasoning there's no structure we've got no clue what's going on the ratio of phosphine to silver complex changes the reaction pattern if you do phosphorus NMR and you titrate phosphines to it your phosphine signal just moves around randomly this really is very unexpected behavior of something that looks so trivial and nobody's working on it then the NRF came back in uh, I think 2012 and said this is all nice and well that you're playing with these silver compounds but we need something more than just the shape of these compounds so when I discussed that with a colleague of mine Professor Marianne Cronier um, over a glass of red wine she said give it to me I'll <laughs> test it for for anti-cancer activity and I said nah doesn't work 
literature states that doesn't work. I've evaluated some of the compounds. It doesn't work. He said, give it anyway. Give it to me anyway. So the first five compounds were handed over to Marianne, and within a week the student came back, eyes oh, about this size, we've got so-called apoptotic behavior. Apoptosis is suicide from the cancer cells. So these cancer cells commit suicide when they so see these silver compounds, um, and they commit suicide at levels 10 times below the concentration of cisplatin. So that was the very first bit of the collaboration with biochemistry, and we can now truly say that we quite literally stepped on the needle of the ha in the haystack. So um, if you want to find a needle in a haystack, you can either sort through the ha completed haystack or just jump in there and hope it y you step on, <laughs> on the thing. And uh, while stepping on it might be a bit more painful, <laughs> it's a very fast way of actually finding it. So, so we were... I would say we were lucky because other compounds that we found later, of the approximately 120 that we've evaluated, some of the other compounds show no behavior, but the first five compounds that we evaluated show not only that they induce apoptosis in silver com in, in, in cancer cells, but also that they're non-toxic to normal cells. And what we think is happening now I need my props. What we think is happening is that the mitochondria of the silver compounds, uh, of the cancer cells, which are slightly different from normal cells, selectively get attacked by these silver compounds. Um, we've evaluated of these silver compounds in mice, and we found that there is no negative effect up to a concentration of 3 gram per kilogram of body weight of the mouse, mice, right? Three gram per kilogram of body weight. That would be the same as when a normal 75 kilogram person is eating these compounds and you eat a complete bottle of this stuff about this size. And there are no negative side effects to the mice. So that's pretty encouraging. And when that got into the media, uh, when that got published earlier this year, the media went completely nuts. These are just some of the newspaper articles that I could quickly find linked to the um, altmetrics uh, profile of the article. About 90% of these papers were missed by, by the uh, altmetric what a company, I suppose. Um, we've had TV interviews for Card Blanche, China Central, uh, radio interviews, countless newspaper articles about this compound where you can literally eat a bottle of it and um, nothing happens to you. So I just wanted to show a little thing. Um, if I this Sunday on Card Blanche. A chance discovery in a lab at the University of Johannesburg has led to a new way of tackling cancer. Even chemotherapy-resistant cancers are treatable with this new compound. That's carte blanche this Sunday at 7, only on Mnet. Um, and as a scientist, we're not, we're not really comfortable with all this attention from the media. So the, uh, hopefully the, la the last article will be in the Shimatsu Momentum journal which is in the to be released issue about the silver compounds um, and they 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 subtitled it worth a weight in gold costs its weight in silver i'm pretty sure they didn't realize that the related gold compounds don't work as anti-cancer <laughs> agents um, so this, this is just a little bit of about my past journey what I find more interesting is what's going to happen in the future, because this we need to look at the future. And in my opinion, chemistry is a very traditional subject. What do I mean with traditional? The synthetic chemistry. <coughs> Analytical chemistry has progressed tremendously. Synthetic chemistry is still completely analog. The glassware we use for our synthesis in, <coughs> in the chemistry lab is typically 
named after Germans that have been dead for about a century. <laughs> right, so the famous Erlenmeyer flask, and I actually was lucky enough to find a copy of the original drawing, is named after Emil Erlenmeyer, who passed away a century and ten years ago. <laughs> and the some of the most used glassware, the slank tubes and slank lines, uh, Willem Slank passed away in the Second World War. So we need <laughs> to improve chemistry. Chemistry needs to go digital, and I think chemistry is going digital. Um, and some of the stuff that we are doing in our research group links into this. Uh, we've started, for example, with 3D printing a very short while ago, and we're developing educational materials. This is a, a molecular modeling kit that we hand out to the first year organic chemistry students. Um, and by making these models ourselves, we bring the price down from about 200 rand per model to about 10 rand per model. So we can hand these out to the students. I'm pretty sure Sigma Aldrich is not happy with this. Because um, <laughs> they obviously are losing quite a lot of a lot of um, business this way. The, the other thing are the space filling models and the nice thing is these models are so correct that an ethane molecule can rotate around the carbon-carbon double bond but your ethylene molecule doesn't rotate around the carbon-carbon bond, double bond and this is the same space filling model. So this can be used to show, show students really the geometry of binding but also the behavior of these um, molecules. In terms of research, we're going completely digital. We have printed complete reactor setups, um, things that look like this from inert polypropylene in the lab, use them to look at the same reaction again. Uh, I'm just keeping the same theme here. Making syringe pumps from 3D printed parts, which drives that price down from 32,000 rand to about 200 rand each. Um, and in the meanwhile, we're learning all kinds of weird and wonderful things that we're not comfortable with. Right? We're learning coding, um, and maybe Professor Ellis can assist us there. <laughs> we're learning robotics. We're learning all kinds of weird and wonderful things that we've never been exposed to. So this is firmly outside our comfort zone again one of those red pill moments where you look at this these applications and you think what can we do with that in chemistry now one of the problems with the printed reactors is that there's a tremendous back pressure built up in other words the catalyst in the catalyst bed clogs the flow so what we did was design 3d design and mold for a catalyst particle, then print the same mold, cast alumina in there so we can make a so-called monolithic block of a catalyst support and then put your catalyst on top of the block. And th these pictures don't really do it a lot of justice. Uh, the actual examples are, are on the outside and you're more than welcome to play with it because we can print another one anytime, anyway. <laughs> now, this is all nice, but let's have a good look at a real problem in chemistry. The real problem in chemistry is that <coughs> we're looking at a tremendous space, conditions space, application space. But chemists all work on their intuition. They've been trained in a certain way. For example, we know palladium does a certain reaction in a certain solvent with a certain ligand. And the only stuff that is published are the reactions that work. There is no journal of failed reactions in <laughs> chemistry. So we are trained to read these journals, see what's the optimum reaction condition, move a little bit away, see that it goes worse, and then we go back to what our intuition tells us. But that has, uh, has the result that we never see if we are looking at the global maximum of our conditions, right? Palladium does carbon-carbon cross-coupling, but very few people realize that nickel does the same reaction. So we need to actually investigate the complete parameter space in catalysis and in chemistry. 
And there are two ways of actually doing that, and we're busy going towards that. The first one is to use uh, uh, combinatorial chemistry or tricks from combinatorial chemistry and see if we can arrive to either new reactions or to an optimum reaction condition space. And the second one is to just go massively parallel with these reactions. And let's just focus on the first thing. This is something, this is work in progress in my group at this moment where we first look at all possible reaction conditions and determine what's the optimal reaction condition. And then take a soup of different catalysts in this case and deconvolute it to the optimal catalyst um, condition. So what do I mean with that? I'm going chemistry again. To the colleagues here will appreciate what, I'm, what we are doing. So we tried this with Heck and Suzuki re reactions where we look at a mixture of six solvents, six bases, and 20 phosphines. By mixing all 20 phosphines in the same pot and all six solvents and using two different batches of three bases, you can find which one is the fastest reaction. And you can, from there, say there is an optimal catalyst species there. Then you take that reaction, separate it in three different bases, with still the 20 phosphines and the six solvents, and you can optimize the base. Once the base is optimized, we can separate the six solvents using the same procedure, and after that you can separate the 20 phosphines using the same procedure. Most of the synthetic chemists here would find this not just strange, completely counterintuitive, right? Because we, we are not used to thinking this way. Now, how do we know this works? Very simple. You d first, you deconvolute the base, the solvent, and the phosphine. On, on the second go, on the same system, you deconvolute the phosphine, and then the base, and then the solvent. And if you get to the same species, in this case, potassium carbonate, acetonitrile, tricyclohexyl phosphine, which the chemist over here will uh, agree with me that, that it sounds like a pretty optimized HEC type system then you know we've got the right species. So th that's the one way we're, we're looking at reaction conditions. Just make a big soup of er everything and then try to separate the soup afterwards and, try and see what the optimum conditions. The other thing that we're doing is going massively parallel. If you want to go massively parallel, you either need a tremendous amount of students or you need liquid handling robots. Mm -hmm. Now, 3D printing has, has improved to a level where a very fine grid can be accessed. The, 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 the errors on the movement are, are really fine, 0.1 millimeter. So based on 3D printers, we're bu busy building a liquid handling robot here that's been published in the literature. In the open literature, everybody can take the plans and build these things. Now, a normal liquid handling robot, if you buy it from a company, and I haven't invited those companies, <laughs> um, <laughs> will set you back about half a million rand. We can, we are at this moment building this thing for approximately 15,000 rand in parts, and in my mind, that is an excellent opportunity for South Africa. Build these robots, get somebody to build these robots for other people that don't want to go through the effort, make a little profit on it and get a spin-off company, get the entrepreneurial um, spirit of the students up and running. Now, where is this going? Th I mean, th this was in the literature already. What I see where this is going is more robotic chemistry. It doesn't mean the chemist's job is gone. It just means the chemist will have to learn how to program the robot. It's a slightly different skill set that we need to learn. And some of the actual cutting edge work is depicted here where the Cronin group in Glasgow took four robots and linked them up via computers initially, very cheap 800 rand computers. And these robots were tweeting at each other what reaction they did so the next robot would not perform the reaction. And of course, the actual research student was just sitting at home with, with the cell phone watching when the reactions are gone. So they've been looking at 
a rather large, or uh, small in this case, reaction space of about nine reactions that these robots did, completely automated. Um, and if you see the picture of the robot, it's really just a bunch of peristaltic pumps with a small, cheap, off-the-shelf little computer board. So I'm seeing this is where chemistry is going, and I, I would suggest that this is a um, way that we need to think at UJ. Can we improve? Can we look at digital synthesis? Should we look at this and develop these skills in our chemistry department? Talking about the chemistry department, where's the chemistry department going? Well, there's a marriage between the Department of Chemistry and the <laughs> Department of Applied Chemistry. And my apologies, um, Professor Governor. I tried to Photoshop your face on there, but it didn't really work. <laughs> 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 this generates probably the largest chemistry department in Africa, mm -hmm. with approximately 60, 60 odd mm -hmm. staff members. Um, in, the, in some of the recent rankings, we were chemistry at UJ was rated as one of the top, of the top the university to do chemistry in Africa. We actually were rated higher than Cairo University, which is something I think we should be really proud of. Um, and we will see what this marriage brings us. Any marriage is there's a chance that it goes wrong, but I think this will be <laughs> a fantastic opportunity to improve collaboration with our colleagues at UJ, improve exchange of ideas, improve the way we're teaching students, the way we approach teaching. This is a fantastic opportunity. And I think this is a very exciting thing. Again, a red pill moment for all staff um, associated with, with the two departments, as well as obviously with the management who will <laughs> have to deal with the hissy fits that are doubtlessly coming. Th this is one fantastic opportunity, but if you combine that with the Shimatsu Innovation Center that has been approved by Shimatsu in Japan, which we are trying to get space on campus, all of a sudden not only do we have the largest chemistry department in Africa with the highest output, but also access to state-of-the-art equipment. I can only imagine what that's going to do for chemistry at UJ. Um, this is such a fantastic opportunity. Finally, I haven't spoken a lot about teaching and learning, but one of the initiatives that we took in, in the Department of Chemistry is a so-called research academy for undergraduate students, where we take in second-year undergraduate students and actually pay them to do research with the postgrads. This teaches them additional chemistry. It also prevents them from doing an arbitrary job to, to get a little bit of money in and focus on their studies rather. And what is fantastic is that we could convince both Dow Chemicals and after that went wrong Investec to sponsor part of this program. And I'm proud to say that quite a number of these undergraduate students get their name on good publications at the end of the road. And this has increased our honors numbers from approximately four a couple of years ago to the approximate 30 that we're looking at today. Ladies and gentlemen, chemistry has a great future at UJ. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> um, what can I say? Prof. Andre and Prof. Andre. <laughs> it's nice to be a third Andre here. <laughs> but uh, everybody also here, but in particular, Reinhardt, Prof. Reinhardt, I think um, I used to think that you can be only inspired by older professors. <laughs> but I was really inspired by what you said. Uh, in your rep uh, your presentation, Reinhardt. I mean, also I was inspired to to actually see what you are doing in terms here, and I think 
I don't only want to congratulate you in terms of these initiatives, but what I really want to do is to congratulate you, Jay, for seeing the possibility of employing you and young guys like you. And there are young guys sitting basically here who basically uh, have also been employed and appointed here. And it just shows you that if a university has a vision, has a feeling, has some strategy, and also has the ability to allow researchers to think freely that what can, in principle, be achieved. So congratulations in terms of what you basically said. I really hope it would be just multiplied even further what you uh, have shown us here. But I have a, a short message for the, the young guys who with the blinking eyes who are sitting here who form part of this fantastic group and also from part of this fantastic chemistry department. Coming from the Free State, you know the Free State is not for sissies, but uh, <laughs> uh, specifically if you look at the temperatures nowadays in there, but uh, I think back fondly of my time uh, that I was able to spend here, and I'm envious. And I think most chemistry departments should be envious in terms of what you, you have basically achieved here. So please continue this way, inspire us, Hopefully, we will be able to have more contact in future in terms of our departments, long um, in need that we have. Hopefully, I will be able to have contact with most of you young guys sitting here. Um, final point. Uh, I am really also impressed with the fact that the industry is collaborating and contributing so much to this chemistry. I think the, chemi the industry should be acknowledged. I wanted to say here tonight that I feel I'm proud as a father, but I cannot be the real father of this guy because his father's sitting here. So at least he's my sort of adopted son. But I really hope that this kind of free spirit that we, we, we saw tonight here very briefly, uh, it will be reflected in this joke that some of you might know, there is a comic strip that's available on the website that's called PhD Comics. So every week, one of these uh, interesting things are published at the level that PhD chemists can understand. And what stands out to me is the four phases of research. The first one, you had this one where this young guy was standing there, potential PhD student, and he says, I'm going to research anything I want. <laughs> and th then it moves on to the next slide, and you see this young professor who basically is saying, I'm going to research what gives me a full-time position. <laughs> and the third picture is, you see this older, more <coughs> sophisticated, Reinhard Mayboom standing there saying, I'm going to research what the research councils demand. <laughs> and then you see the old guy like me walking like this, saying that I'm going to research anything I want. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we get the chance and that the universities allow us, and I think UJ is at the front in terms of this, to allow these kind of initiatives to proceed, and I'm pretty sure it will happen in the rest of chemistry. So, as I said, I'm envy, uh, but I'm really proud to be able to stand here. So I wish you all the best, Reynard, you and your lovely wife and your uh, parents specifically, but the whole chemistry department. And please, never stop losing the blink in your eyes. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, our professor has professed. <laughs> and I think we can give him another round of applause as he, <laughs> as he and the acting dean will come forward. Join me in front here just for the roving process.